All right, jump shots from the goal line. Listeners, we have another great interview for you today. We are still going over um, our conference previews. We are diving even deeper into the SEC. We have a phenomenal guest with us here today. Um, we have the host of Locked On SEC, part of the Locked On Network. We have Chris Gordy. He is going to be going um, through a number of things of the SEC. Obviously, it is the biggest conference in college football, so there's much to be had, much to be talked about. Chris, how are you today? Doing good, guys. Thanks for having me. Of course, man. Thanks for giving some time today. I mean, hey, we know you're a busy guy. You were just at SEC Media Day not that long ago. You went to the Manning Passing Academy. I'm sure that there's a lot of things that we can talk about today. Um, John, you, do you want to go ahead and, and give Chris your introduction? Yeah, and, and Chris, I know we've got a chat for just a few seconds here, but I'm just going to throw you right into the deep end. This is kind of what we've decided we're, we do around here. So um, we're just going to try to play a little game with you. I mean, basically, you know, there's no there's no rules. We don't have a format. This is purely <laughs> a canvas for you to paint in which, whichever way you feel fit. Um, <laughs> but kind of the question is just if just to kind of get to know these SEC quarterbacks, largely our audience, you know, we're, you know, people are picking us up everywhere, but largely West Coast folks who may not know these SEC quarterbacks as well. Um, we saw kind of nitpicking through some of the things that you talk about that maybe you have a good feel for for Southern rappers, for perhaps Houston rappers in particular. And so what we like to do is just see if we can compare a couple of those quarterbacks to some rappers, right? So whether it's, um, you know, I, I'll just try to give an example. Like for, for me, uh, you know, I want to watch KJ Jefferson and I don't really care where he's ranked, where he stands in it. Um, so to me, he's kind of like like young Jeezy, who's a Southern rapper, right? Like I don't really care where he ranks in the Pantheon or, or where he stacks up in greatness. I just want to hear it. So <laughs> yeah. with that, I will just kind of open it up to you and you can take that in any direction you like. There is no wrong answer. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the Houston rap scene is big enough that that you know we could we could do this list all day. We could probably do a one for one for every quarterback. <laughs> but you mentioned KJ Jefferson. Uh, to me, he's chameleonaire, very underappreciated. When you look at his discography, all he does is deliver. So to me, uh, KJ Jefferson is chameleonaire. I would say Bryce Young is probably like Bun B. He's the OG. Everything he touches Ooh. turns to gold. Very successful. So okay. that would be Bryce Young. Uh, Will Levis at Kentucky, I would say, is Paul Wall. Obviously, he's the white guy, but real flashy. <laughs> and I think if you, if you got Will Levis a grill, I'm sure he would wear it and flaunt it. So I think he's a little bit like Paul Wall. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Hendon Hooker, I would say maybe like Megan the Stallion, newer on the scene, but making an impact <laughs> felt. So I would say that. And then, uh, you know, Stetson Bennett, I'm going to go Lil Troy because – very underappreciated, maybe viewed as a one-hit wonder, but man, that one hit was a big hit. So Stetson Bennett is little Troy. Who's Slim Thug though? Oh man, um, maybe maybe uh, Miles Brennan because you know kind of forgotten. You go back and look, and you go, oh yeah, he did do a song with Destiny's Child. Oh yeah, he did do a song with <laughs> Lil Wayne. And so yeah, maybe maybe he's Miles Brennan. He's just been around a while, and you're like, oh yeah, I forgot about that guy. I love it, man. Wow. Bravo, sir. Clap, clap, clap it up. That was incredible. <laughs> I'm a big Houston rap guy. John and I have this conversation all the time. I think it's underappreciated, and I think it has set the table for what we're getting today. I just, you know, I hope somebody comes out like Lil' Keek and just blows up. That'd be great. But awesome, man. I, I greatly appreciate you giving our audience, if they are familiar with Houston rap, which they should be, a little uh, glimpse into you know, where the QB stack up into the SEC. Um, so bravo again. You know, speaking of those QBs in the SEC, I would, you know, pander to say probably the strongest conference in college football when it comes to the quarterbacks. Is is that what you're kind of seeing? Yeah, I, you know, and we'll get to it later, but I was at the Manning Passing Academy a few weeks ago and then being at SEC Media Days, you know, I, I kind of looked around and said, man, this this has got to be one of the stronger years for quarterbacks in the SEC. And you go back several years ago, I think there was one point where it was, uh, it, you had a lot of M's. It was like Johnny Manziel, Zach Mettenberger. It, 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 was, it was a pretty good crop. Uh, but, you know, there's just always so much turnover in this league. And, and there's always, you know, guys who are, you know, you have like a Matt Jones, who's like a one-hit wonder. He comes in, does the job. 
uh, wins a championship, and then he's off to the NFL, and he's getting drafted by the Patriots. So you, know, you got yep. some guys who are who are very quick in and out. Uh, but right now, I think you got a really good mix of savvy vets, a couple of guys who are you know you have some quarterback battles going on. But I uh, you know I think I think you know you could say maybe it's top heavy. But I think even some of those guys in the middle, like when you start ranking them, you start going, man, like I got this guy eighth. Like, you know, it's it's really hard mm-hmm. to 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 do a solid rankings because you just there's just some unknowns like a, a Spencer Rattler at South Carolina. Literally a year ago right now, he was the Heisman favorite at Oklahoma. Like if you want to bet on the Heisman odds, he was the favorite. And now here yeah. he is a year later in a new spot at South Carolina. And he's kind of like the afterthought. People are like, oh, maybe South Carolina can compete in the East. But like uh, there's guys like that. <clears throat> And then, you know, you got you, Bryce Young is the cream of the crop. Obviously, he's the Heisman Trophy winner and he's back for another year. But you got yeah. this other crop of guys like Hendon Hooker at Tennessee, who was phenomenal last year. Will Levis at Kentucky, who I think it's Chris Vanini of The Athletic has him in his very early mock draft going number one overall in next year's NFL draft. So oh you, have him, you have KJ Jefferson, who's just a gamer. Like, go look at his stats. And it's like not not eye popping. It's not impressive. But man, like mm-hmm. time and time again. They need to win a game. He puts the team on his back and they go down and get a game winning field goal or touchdown or whatever. So there's a whole crop of guys like that. And then, you know, a little bit of the unknowns, like, uh, like I said, uh, you know, Miles Brennan, I think is a guy who's battled injuries throughout his years at LSU. He's only started a handful of games, but go look at those games. He threw for like 300, 400 yards in those games. And it's like, well, what are we getting with him? So it's, uh, it's a really, really good crop. And I do think this is a year where the uh, quarterback is going to be a strength of the SEC. Yeah, I I totally tend to agree. I know, John, you're super high on Anthony Richardson from Florida. Like, where would you stack him up, Chris? Yeah, like as I was going through and just kind of off the off the tip, you know, running through my my rankings, I put him kind of in the middle. But he's a guy that like I call him Cam Newton light. I say light Mm. because he's not Cam Newton, but like has the potential to be that last year when we saw him, he's got the big arm. I think like early in the year when they were playing like USF and teams like that, he was just throwing bombs. And, uh, and then when he takes off running, man, it's like an 80 yard run or whatever. Like he can, he's got the speed and the wheels. So uh, there were Florida fans who were as good as Emory Jones was, was last year. There were Florida fans calling for Anthony Richardson to start early last year. That's how special of a, of a recruit he was. And that's how good of a talent he can be. So I'm really curious to see what he does this year at, at Florida. I know some people are picking them, you know, either middle of the East or, or even bottom half of the East to finish this year because it's Bill, Billy Napier's first year. But if they can stay healthy, uh, you know, with their starters, like Anthony Richardson has a real good chance to impress a lot of people this year. And I've even seen some mock drafts that have him going in the first round next year. So he's hmm. he's one I would have middle of the pack right now, but a real, real opportunity to impress. Yeah, I, I love him just because of the athleticism. Obviously, he's he's just kind of one of those guys that you mentioned, Cam Newton Light. Even Cam Newton Light is an incredible compliment, right? Because of how special Cam Newton was. Um, it, w- is there anybody else? I guess because I mean, I'm always curious, curious about him. I really like KJ Jefferson, as you mentioned, just a gamer. Again, like it, it might not be, uh, it doesn't look like NFL quarterback play, but it certainly is quarterback play, and it's winning football that he plays. Um, is there anybody else out there that? is kind of creeping up like, or someone that, you know, maybe we'll see some, some snaps just kind of like we saw with Richardson, just to to give a spark or just like another athlete that's kind of hiding out there in the sec that we may not know about. Well, Hendon hooker is the one that intrigues me a lot at Tennessee because this is a guy who didn't even start week one last year, Mm -hmm. eventually took over, but finished the year with 3000 passing yards, 31 touchdowns and three interceptions. Like when you look at those numbers and go, Oh my God, like that's really, really impressive. And it's a Josh Heupel effect. I mean, in his time at UCF, all his quarterbacks do, did was throw for bombs and throw for tons of touchdowns. And, you know, that's what we saw at a handed hooker. You know, he transferred him for Virginia Tech. So he's another guy that can really climb up some draft boards if he has a big year for Tennessee. Now, there's one caveat with Hendon Hooker. When you look at what he did last year, the only ranked team he beat was Kentucky. They lost to Georgia. They lost to Bama. They lost to Ole Miss. They lost to Florida. Now, part of that is the defense stunk. And I don't know if the defense is going to be much better at Tennessee this year. I think their pass rush has a chance to be better, but uh, Hendon mm-hmm. Hooker is going to have to win some shootouts like he did at tennis at Kentucky last year. So uh, again, like when you just look at those numbers, the 31 touchdowns, the three interceptions, nobody was doing that last year. And so I think Hendon Hooker with a real opportunity, you know, I, I would consider him a dark horse for the Heisman. The problem with that is you got to win a lot of games. You can't 
you know, very rarely are you winning the Heisman four or five losses. So he's going to have to be very special. And the reason Tennessee is winning games and, and pulling off upsets, but he's got the potential too. So I like Hendon Hooker. And then don't forget the two, the two kind of forgottens. One is Will Rogers at Mississippi State, who was third in the country in passing yards last year. Like all he yep. does is deliver the Mike, the Mike Leach system at Mississippi State. You know, he's going to throw for 300, 400 yards a game again. Um, you know, but their schedule is absolutely brutal at Mississippi State. So that's why, you know, I can't even pick Will Rogers and Mississippi State to, to do some damage in the in the West. They're just the, – the schedule is absolutely brutal. But then the other one, again, like he's the afterthought, afterthought. He's the forgotten. He's the guy nobody wants to talk about. But Stetson Bennett at Georgia is the reigning national championship winner. He literally put the team on his back in the fourth quarter and won them the national championship. And then I, I see all these – you know, preseason, here's my top five SEC quarterbacks this season. It's like, he's not even in there. And it's like, what are we doing? Like, uh, yeah. he looked phenomenal in the spring game. Like, I, I really got to give him his props. And I think we're going to see a dynamic shift with Georgia this year. Georgia last year was, we're going to run the football. We're going to throw efficient passes. But our defense is so suffocating and dominant. That's what's going to win us games. I think this year, the offense has a chance to be even better at Georgia this year. As they get Eric wow. Gilbert in, who was a former tight end at, L at, at LSU, who's uh, now a wide receiver at Georgia. Him with Brock Bowers, who was an all-freshman tight end last year, and all the other weapons they have at receiver, they're still loaded in the backfield. I think Georgia has a chance to be one of the best offenses in the country this year. And I think Stetson Bennett is going to make a lot of us scratch our heads and go, wait, why did we not have this guy ranked higher preseason? Yeah, we had Braden Gall on from the uh, from Athlon Sports, and he kind of said the same thing that Georgia, that their tight ends could be the best group of like that position with in the in the country, let alone the conference. Um, do you have like the similar thoughts? Then that the strength of their offense is definitely going to come from that tight end room. Yeah, yeah, and 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 again, like Eric Gilbert is a, he's a tight end slash wide receiver, so I don't know how they're going to line mm -hmm. him up. I know it was a big deal about where he lines up. The LSU's got the same thing, and a guy named Jack Besh who was a tight end, but they've moved him to wide receiver. He's still going to play out of the slot, so it, to me, it, it doesn't really matter what your label is. What are you doing out there on the field? But I think George has really got a chance for the the offense to be a strength this year. And I, I almost said it's like role reversal with Alabama. Like Alabama last year was high-flying offense, throwing for a ton of yards. Defense was pretty good, but it was that offense that would win you games. I think this year that's Georgia. Georgia's going to have the offense winning games, and I think Alabama goes back to what Georgia was last year, dominating, suffocating defense. Uh, Bryce Young maybe, you know, I don't want to say takes a step back, but less productive from la than last year because I think Bama's going to get back to running the football more this year, which is typically their bread and butter. They bring in Jameer Gibbs from Georgia Tech. I think uh, I think Bama's going to get back to running the football more, and they're going to have to rely less on Bryce Young uh, making big arms with it, big plays with his arm. But you know, keep in mind, you do lose Jamison Williams, you do lose John Mechie. Those are two huge dynamic receivers that Alabama had last year that are gone in the NFL now. So, uh, yeah, I think Alabama's going to be a little bit more like Georgia was a year ago. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Especially Will Anderson there. Now, let me ask you, you're a Louisiana guy and you mentioned Eric Gilbert a couple of times, obviously his whole saga throughout college football has been well documented, right? Do you, do you see a different Eric Gilbert than when he was at LSU? Is he actually going to get on the field and, and make a difference? And do you think he can kind of, um, you know, untarnish his name from his Louisiana state days? Yeah, it's it's an interesting uh, story, and I still I still don't know the whole story. A lot of other people don't know the whole story with, with Eric Gilbert. He's a kid who was the top tight end in the country. LSU wins the national championship, and he comes out and immediately commits to LSU. And it was just one of those things where it's like, all right, you know, they're the flavor of the week. Uh, Ed Ogeron is winning the championship, the Joe Burrow special year and all that. And Eric Gilbert, you know, commits to LSU. If LSU doesn't win the championship, I don't think Eric Gilbert ever ends up at LSU. But he comes in last year and was pretty productive. They, they you know, had some issues where it was kind of like they they told him we're going to get you X targets per, per game. And, you know, we're kind of mandating the offense to, hey, we got to get the ball into this guy's hands and, and all this kind of stuff. But he had some uh, – and this was two years ago, by the way. He had some, uh, some issues off the field, and whether it's ac academics, some personal issues in his life, all kinds of stuff like that. Ends up transferring. I think at one point he committed to Florida. Uh, then he backed off that. And then it was, okay, he's transferring to Georgia. 
ends up at Georgia and was just kind of a forgotten all last year. Like just Mm -hmm. was out of football. And again, I don't know the full story, but everything, all signs point to, he's gotten everything figured out um, off the field and personal stuff. And he's ready to go. And we saw him in the spring game and man, was he impressive? I mean, every time, you know, in short field, short yardage situations, he was wide open. He's catch making tough catches, fine in the end zone a couple of times. So yeah, I just think it's it's another embarrassment of riches for Georgia in that offense and another wrinkle that's that's really going to be productive for them. And again, they've been without Brock Bowers, the uh, All-American tight end from a year ago as a true freshman. And, you know, he's he's been out with a off, off-season surgery, but he's going to be back soon. And, you know, that's just another ridiculous weapon for Stetson Bennett to, to get the ball to. And I mean, the thing with Stetson is, you know, like him or not, he's not going to get worse. Like he's, he's either going to stay the same or he's going to improve and the accuracy will get better and he'll get more comfortable in the pocket. And I I just think there's a real chance for Georgia to do something special on offense this year. Awesome. Yes. I I think, I think you're right with Stetson, right? He's kind of a a Matt Garrison, if you will. He just kind of quietly under the radar. He's that steady force. And if you're a Friday night lights guy, I guess you get that. And if you don't, I'm I'm sorry, but um, (laughs) I I, I did want to ask you about it just to kind of stay on the quarterbacks and and we appreciate you, you know, breaking them all down for us. But um, the two newcomers, uh, Spencer Rattler, Jackson Dart, um, both kind of West Coast guys. So there's some some interest in, in them out here, I think, in terms of just how they ultimately finish their careers. Do you think one has a, a better situation um, stepping into it? I think they both have have arm talent. It, it may just be as simple as who's around them or, or what's your feeling in, in talking amongst your folks out there. Yeah, I know this when it comes to Ole Miss. It, there's no guarantee that that Jackson Dart's going to be the guy. Um, you know, I think Lane is in a tough spot right now because – they brought Jackson Dart in and kind of r- tried to ramp him up real quick. And then if you saw that spring game for Ole Miss, my God, it was just quarterback was a debacle, particularly Dart. I mean, he was just throwing interceptions and making bad reads and all this. And Lane even said after the the game that, you know, he thought he was pressing too much. He was trying to impress, trying to earn the starting job. Luke Altmaier is is not a bad quarterback. He's the kid who got into the, the Sugar Bowl when Matt Corral went down with injury. Altmaier was kind of thrown in the fire and, yeah, he makes an inter- throws an interception early, makes a couple mistakes, but also leads him on a touchdown drive and gets him kind of back into the game. So um, I think if they end up going with Luke Altmaier, it's because he's the safe pick. It's because they can, mm-hmm. you know, they can, um, you know, he can make some of the throws. Jackson Dart is the the wild card. Like if everything hits with him, he can hit the home run ball. He can be the big time playmaker. So uh, that's going to be an interesting quarterback battle. It's still going to continue on these next couple of weeks. I, I think a lot of people have penciled in Dart, but I would just say I would not be shocked if they end up announcing Luke Altmaier uh, wins the job over Jackson Dart. But uh, Lane has done a great job of, of crushing it in the in the transfer portal. They brought in a lot of guys. I just wonder how quickly do they all mesh? You know, when you bring in Malik Keith, when you bring in Jordan Watkins and Jalen Robinson and all these different pieces, like how quickly do they gel uh, with with the, the guys that you have? They bring in two new running backs and Zach Evans from TCU, Ulysses Bentley from SMU, and um, Lane Kevin's going to run the football. I think that's another underrated aspect nobody pays attention to. Ole Miss ran the heck out of the football last year. I think they – uh, led the SEC in yards per carry with Jerry and Ely and Snoop Connor and all those guys. So I think um, I think the Ole Miss one will be interesting. And then South Carolina, I'm I'm just I'm a Spencer Rattler fan. Uh, when you look at what South Carolina's had at quarterback the last few years, it's not been good. Luke Doty was very average for them when he was playing. I mean, they they even took a grad assistant off the practice field, threw him in their quarterback last year in Zeb Nolan, and, and so like that's how bad the quarterback spot has been. Rattler comes in and gives them some stability there. It's just, you know, I was talking with him a couple of weeks ago. He was telling me that, you know, they didn't even have their full complement of receivers in in the spring. Like they weren't even fully healthy. And so they, oh, wow. they still don't know really what this offense is going to look like. I think it could be really good. Josh Fan was very productive last year. They bring in Antoine Wells as a transfer. Uh, DK Joyner is a former quarterback playing wide receiver who was really good. He was the, the king of the uh, or the MVP of the Dukes Mayo Bowl. So, uh, they got a lot of weapons there. I just it, It's all about how quickly does Spencer Rattler gel with those guys. He brings in Austin Stogner with him from Oklahoma, who can be really good at that tight end spot. So uh, it, it's I'm very intrigued by South Carolina. Like, if you told me South Carolina goes 6-6 six and six this year, I'd go, okay, I could see it. If you tell me they're going to get the 10 wins and get to a New Year's Six Bowl, I could say, hey, Shane Beamer's a heck of a coach. I, I would not be shocked by that. So 
South Carolina is the biggest wild card of the bunch to me, especially in the SEC East. Yeah, totally. And you you just mentioned Shane Beamer, right? I know you were just at SEC Media Day. What were your impressions of of some of the head coaches that you saw at SEC Media Day? Like who who was the biggest personality? Who impressed you the most? What were some of your impressions? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's funny. With Shane Beamer, some people like him, some people don't. I heard one pe- one person even describe him as a as a try hard, you know, that it's just, you know, he does these TikTok videos and he's trying to be out there <laughs> with the guys and hey, you know, I'm not that older than you guys than you guys and that sort of thing. And then yeah. you got guys like Sam Pittman that are just literally the first time or the next time I hear somebody say something bad about Sam Pittman, it'll be the first. Like no one has ever said a bad word about Sam Pittman. He's the nicest guy. His players love him. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, he does these ridiculous recruiting videos, his catchphrases. Yes, sir. Uh, every time he gets a recruit, he's just the most likable dude. And so that I found that interesting. I think a lot of people, it may skew their image, their, um, you know, their vision too, when it comes to picking Arkansas, I think they're, they can compete in the West this year. And I like AJ Jefferson a lot. I think part of that is because people like Sam Pittman so much that it's like, man, he's so likable. Um, you know, that was, that was a big part of, of media days. Then two newcomers, Brian Kelly and, uh, and Billy Napier, I think are going to fit in just fine in the sec. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. I was talking with people all week, like who's on the hot seat. And like, there's really only two guys in my mind this year. It's Eli Drinkwitz at Missouri and probably Brian Harson at Auburn and, and Harson, you know, if you believe the reports out there, they were trying to get him fired back in, back in January. And he ends up surviving and he's here for another year, but that means you gotta, uh, you gotta turn this thing around and, and you gotta win more games this year. Uh, Missouri too. I mean, you know, think Missouri, the basketball is still King there, but it doesn't mean they don't care about football. And since they've been in the sec, they had some early success in the early years with uh, Gary Pinkle, but uh, ever since, it's just kind of been trying to find the right guy. And Eli Drinkwitz comes over, who is a big offensive-minded guy. And right now, they don't even know who, know who their quarterback is to start the season. So uh, those are the two guys who I think could be on the way out after this year. But pretty stable. Pretty stable for the state of the SEC in a, a league that is turning over coaches constantly. And, you know, basically, as soon as you get in the SEC, the clock is ticking. And if you don't win within three years, you are gone um i'd say that they're, they they have the most stability right now among sec coaches uh across the conference yeah i mean you mentioned billy napier over at florida i mean he's coming in from you know kicking butt at louisiana he brings over montrell johnson who we're both university of arizona guys he was actually committed to us at one point um and he ran the hell out of the ball uh at louisiana do you see a similar kind of offense there down in Florida where they're going to run the hell out of the ball? And what were your impressions of Billy Napier uh, when he spoke at SEC Media Day? Yeah, he's uh, he's definitely from the Saban tree of, of coaches. He is uh, He's going to recruit. That's a big reason why they got rid of Dan Mullen. Dan Mullen was a good coach, was doing just fine in Florida, but could not recruit at a high level. And that's what they're hoping that Billy Napier does. I know he's already been pulling in guys through the transfer portal, but it, it's got to start with that ground game. And yeah, you're right. I mean, Florida has been very inconsistent in running the running the football in recent years, particularly under Dan Mullen. So yeah, I think whether it's Naquan Wright, whether it's Montreal Johnson, uh, they brought in Trevor ATN, brother of Travis ATN uh, in, in the, this recruiting class. So they got some good running backs back there. They bring in Osiris Torrance, a right guard who has been on all the preseason watch lists. Uh, if the offensive line can protect and, and the run game produces, I think Napier's got a chance to win some games this year that that maybe he's not supposed to. But I think most people are pro- kind of predicting a seven and five type season. I think most Florida fans would take that kind of understand it. It's a, it's a transition. And uh, again, the big thing is he's just got to get them uh, higher in recruiting. And if they finish this class, you know, in December with a, you know, let's say a, a top 10 or a top 11 or 12 ranking. I think a lot of Gator fans would absolutely take that. So that's, that's the big thing with Billy Napier. It's, it's, they have no depth on that Florida roster right now. Like it was a lot of talent, the starters, but man, if they start having injury after injury, this season could go South very quickly just because of lack of depth. Yeah. So I, I think Chris, you touched on, I mean, everything, uh, you know, you're saying, I think, you know, falls along with like what we're hearing in terms of, you know, consensus and, you know, what the group think is nationally in terms of, you know, like you mentioned Pittman and I think everybody just likes that guy. And uh, you mentioned Napier and he, he maybe falls in line with some of those, as you mentioned, as a Saban disciple and a, and a bit of a, a bit of a, 
mm, I don't know what the word is for, for Saban, but he's interesting and he's going to run his program the way he runs his program. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was like, I don't, I don't know if I'm ready to go there with Napier. So I, I laid low, but, um, but I, I am curious about the fit with Brian Kelly and I know you're an LSU alum. So I think from the outside looking in it, it doesn't seem like the natural fit, right? We've seen the awkwardness in the videos, but we also know that he's a very good coach. And I don't think anybody questions that he's going to win games there, but maybe sell me on the fit or if maybe if you don't think it's a fit, but I, it's, it sounds like you probably do. Um, you know, why does it work with, with Brian Kelly and, and what is the, the casual observer missing? Yeah. Back in 2000, when they brought in this little short st- uh, statured man from Michigan state to come be the new head coach, uh, they didn't ask him if he liked gumbo. They didn't ask him if he liked jambalaya. They didn't ask him if he could eat, you know, put, peel crawfish. Like none of that stuff matters in South Louisiana. All they want is a winner. And, you know, I think it, we fall into the trap a little bit because Coach Ed Ogeron was, you know, he was one of us and he talked like us and he had the gruff uh, Cajun accent and all that and, and loved the culture of Louisiana and all that. But I, I think the word culture doesn't matter if you win, you know, and I think that's what most people are expecting with Brian Kelly. If he comes in and he wins, they don't care if he hangs out at the tailgates and uh, can make a good rue or whatever, you know, like all, all the, all that matters is winning. And when you look at Brian Kelly, he's won everywhere he's been, you know, go look at his track record at Grand Grand Valley state, central Michigan, Cincinnati, Notre Dame. Uh, The guy wins almost immediately. And if not immediately, it's by year two, he's winning, you know, more games than he, than he won the year before and starting to establish a winner. I think a lot of people forget that at Notre Dame. Like, Charlie Weiss, Tyrone Willingham, they weren't winning 10 games a year. Like, he made mm-hmm. that the norm at Notre Dame. Yeah, 10 wins a year is the expectation, and, you know, we, they had even higher expectations. No, we should be getting 11, 12 wins to get in the playoff, and, and he did that a couple times. But I think what Brian Kelly saw ultimately was – there was a ceiling on the type of kid he could recruit at Notre Dame. He still had to be really smart. He still had to, you know, go through all the the, the different things that go into being part of Notre Dame and the culture there at LSU. And I say this as a proud LSU alum, and I've got my degree hanging up on my wall. If you can write your name on a piece of paper, they're going to pass you. So, um, you know, I think it's a different type of recruit that Brian Kelly's going to get at at LSU. And it's a very unique spot for recruiting. Louisiana is very talent rich. They put out some of the, you know, I think – You know, they do stories on this all the time, like per capita uh, talent in the NFL that was born in the state of Louisiana. It's like ridiculous uh, how much NFL talent they put out there. You don't you don't compete with anybody in your state for high level recruits and all the other schools you typically do. You know, Alabama's got to fight with Auburn. Texas has to fight with Texas A&M and Baylor and all these other schools in Louisiana. It's LSU and then it's nothing else. I mean, sorry, no disrespect to the ULL or ULM or any of those other schools, they're not getting LSU talent. So, um, you know, the big thing is, and, and Saban talked about it, Les Miles talked about it, and Ed Ogeron talked about it. You put up a fence around the state, you try to keep most of the talented kids in your state, recruit them. And the added bonus is Brian Kelly's coached a lot of different places. He's recruited nationally already. He can walk into living rooms and, you know, he's been to Cincinnati. He's been to Los Angeles. He's been to Boston. He's been all over the place in living rooms recruiting kids at Notre Dame because that's just kind of how they recruit in Notre Dame. It's not just recruiting Midwest kids. So, um, yeah, I'm excited to see what he does. Uh, I've heard from several reporters and people covering him. They've said, you know, again, no offense to Les Miles or Ed Ogeron, but this guy sounds like Saban. Like, we haven't had a guy like this who can get up there and hold a competent conversation with the media uh, and is just in full control of his program. Uh, It feels like you're never going to have a guy skip class or be late to a meeting like you had under Ed Ogeron with Brian Kelly. He's just, he demands a certain level of excellence. And if you're not meeting that that standard, it's all right, well, there's the door. See you later. Um, So I think, you know, that's why it gives me reason to believe he's going to win a national championship at LSU within the next four years. And the reason why, well, the last three idiots all did it. So, um, you know, it's, it's typically uh, it's like I said, all you need is lightning in a bottle. All you need is a Joe Burrow type season or uh, you know Matt Flynn type season in 07 with less miles all you need is one of those special years where you get good quarterback play you got elite defense and find your way to a championship and I think Brian Kelly's going to do it but I think it's got to start up front recruiting wise LSU's gotten pushed around the trenches the last couple of seasons and as you know one of Brian Kelly's strengths has been developing offensive linemen he put out a lot of them at Notre Dame Mm -hmm. into the NFL so I, if you look at their recruiting, that's kind of where they're starting is trying to get in some of these offensive and defensive linemen into this early class to start building that up. But, yeah, look, it's a murderer's row. We know that. the S, Not just the SEC, but the SEC West. It's it's a tough environment. But 
I think uh, I think a lot of these coaches are also looking at that guy in uh, Tuscaloosa and saying, man, how much longer does this guy want to do this? When you talk about NIL, the transfer portal, all these new things, you know, we already saw it in basketball where Jay Wright got out and Roy Williams got out and Coach K got out. Saban is 72. Man, how much longer do you want to do this? I know he's built a, a ridiculous juggernaut there, but man, when you're having to re-recruit your own roster every couple of months, I could see Nick Saban going, oh, look, we'll do this another year or two and then we'll hang it up. Yeah, for sure. I could totally see that as well. Oh, it sounds like LSU is going to be in a much better place going forward. I know my my brother's a huge Notre Dame fan, so I can attest to that. Like, man, they put out insane, insane players on both sides of the line. I can think of like, you know, Ronnie Stanley, Jerry Tillery on the other yeah. side of the line. And if he can do that LSU, which it sounds like he definitely can, because that's definitely a hotbed of talent. It's going to be it's going to be pretty scary for the West, uh, the rest of the SEC West going forward for sure. Yeah, let, let me um, just can, let me just say on that real yeah. quick. I was just going to say like he got a lot of heat for leaving Notre Dame the way he did, and I'll just say this: there's no <laughs> right way to leave a school, but like the way recruiting is now with the early signing period, if you don't get out early, like if you if it's one of those things, well, let me hang around and finish the bowl game. Like, no, you're already behind on your next job. If that's yep. the case, you got to go start recruiting immediately. And that's what Brian Kelly did. And so it was a weird national reaction. Like everybody cut nationally, like ESPN, they tried to turn him into this bad guy. Oh, look, he left his players. And then there was this big rallying cry behind Marcus Freeman. Oh, see, he wants to be here. Yeah, you upped his money. You made him a head coach, his first head coaching <laughs> job. Of course he wants to be there. Uh, but it was this big rallying cry. And so, it, it, look, I hope Notre Dame has success it's just it's a big gamble on a guy who's never been a head coach before. And you know, I reminded my friend who's a Notre Dame fan, I said, you know, you guys are already 0-1 in the Marcus Freeman era. You lost the bowl game. Oh, yeah, well, he was in a tough situation. No, he was the head coach of that game. So, anyway, it just it, it, it was just very odd. And, and I think, you know, when you look around college football, whenever guys are leaving for a better opportunity, they're leaving because, yeah, it's a lot of money, but it's a better opportunity overall that they want to go and try to achieve success. And I – I just think there's never a right way to do it. Like, so for some reason, people are like, no, you got to wait till this date or wait till after the bowl game or whatever. Yeah, if I wait for the bowl game, I'm literally behind a full recruiting cycle. Yeah, that's uh, that, those things are here. I mean, as long as like the players have freedom of movement, too, I think that stuff's all here or there. Like, I mean, that's that's all fine to me. Like, this is a love and war situation and all is fair. But I guess Chris, what I would just ask is if, as an LSU guy and probably someone who's going to have access to Brian can we just like have him keep up the shtick with the, with the Southern accent? Like we need, we need something from the LSU. Like when LSU wins, right. I, I do think college football is better. And like Friday nights, we know like, you know, that's a special place. And, but like less miles eating the grass, Ed Orgeron's ridiculous accent, all those things you mentioned, we kind of want to keep that. Like we don't want him to become Sabanized. <laughs> so how can you meet us in the middle here? So, cause like I want to root for LSU, but frankly, Chris, like I'm not really enjoying Brian Kelly. So help me. Yeah, I mean, look, it, it was funny. The two big things of the offseason that made headlines of Brian Kelly, one was the fact that he said the word family weird at a basketball game. <laughs> and then the other one was he was dancing with some recruits in TikTok videos. One of them ended up being one of the top rated quarterbacks that they ended up signing in Walker Howard. So I would say it worked out for him that he was able to, uh, you know, who cares if he danced? He got the recruits. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's a stark comparison or contrast, I'd say, to you know, what Ed Ogeron was making headlines for the last year. There was everything from <laughs> he was hitting on a booster's wife at a gas station to violating <laughs> Title IX policy, you know, r reports of a, you know, a sexual assault or a guy, a player beating his girlfriend and was supposedly reported to a coach and then kind of didn't go anywhere and wasn't reported to the university. So I'd say, you know, if those are the headlines that Brian Kelly's going to make, dancing in a TikTok video, video and saying family – Look, we'll take that at LSU if that's the, the worst thing that he's going to do for the program. But no, I mean, I, I, I got to interview him last week and I put out the interview on YouTube for anybody who wants to look it up, Locked on SEC. Um, I, he's a pretty nice guy. I mean, just kind of talking with him. But he did say he does have a sense of humor. And a couple of the players I talked to, you know, I said, give me a word to describe Coach Kelly. And they all said hilarious. And I'm going, hilarious is not the first thing I think of when I think of Brian Kelly. So right. I think he's going to bring a little bit of the sense of humor. I think we're going to see that. But again, LSU, Baton Rouge fans, they don't care. They just want to win. And, uh, again, last three head coaches have all won national championships. Even in the Nick Saban era, uh, with him being at Alabama, the expectations are Brian Kelly's going to do the same. Yeah, I will say that when you did interview him and he talked about just sweating his ass off 
golfing. <laughs> that, that showed me a little bit of a different side of Brian Kelly I hadn't seen before, and I can definitely relate to it. Um, so that was that was awesome. Now, just one more question on SEC Media Day. So John and I are both huge Mike Leach fans, uh, just being Pac-12 guys and just his hilarity that he brings in any kind of press conference. Like, is obviously he's probably high up on your list of people, like coaches you want to attend their press conferences. Who else brings that level of personality in those conferences? Yeah, I think like if we're having a fantasy draft and you get to have a beer with an SEC coach, I would say the number one overall, you know, number one overall overwhelming pick would be Mike Leach. Um, <laughs> after that, you know, man, it, it, it's, it starts to get – Jimbo Fisher is, is a trip. Just just listen to him talk. I mean, he's almost like an auctioneer. He talks so fast and starts going <laughs> and going and going. I wasn't the biggest fan of him, you know, getting into it with the NIL stuff. I understand mm-hmm. why he said what he had to say because – you know, look, they put this stupid stipulation in with NIL where they said you cannot use it as an inducement for recruiting. It doesn't mean anybody's not going to do that, right? I mean, you're still going to violate it. You just can't admit it, you know, and I realized that when I was at the Senior Bowl and I interviewed Steve Sarkeesian and I asked him about it. I was like, hey, hey I saw these stories about, you know, the Longhorn uh, faithful stepping up and, you know, they're they're paying these NIL deals. That's great for recruiting. And he kind of was like, yeah, I, I don't know anything about that. And he kind of backed off. I was like, oh, that's right. They can't. You can't say it. And so that was kind of what mm-hmm. when Saban comes out and says, yeah, AM bought every one of their recruits. Of course, Jimbo's got to call a press conference and go, what is he talking about? We haven't paid anyone and all this. It's just a weird, mysterious thing that when this five star gets on campus the day after he's here, hey, look, he got an NIL deal. You know, it's just got to be this weird <laughs> coincidence thing. Uh, I, I wish they would just lift the rule. I mean, who cares? Like, you know, if big money boosters want to pay 17 year olds who've never played a down in college football to come to their school, there are going to be busts. There are five stars every year that do not pan out or you yep. know, five stars who just become, eh, he's a nice rotation guy, but he wasn't the superstar we thought he was going to be. That It's all going to catch up to one another. So, uh, again, I, I wish they would lift that because I thought that that kind of, uh, you know, forced Jimbo to have to go to bad. And like, he came out and said, well, I, I talked to everybody. We only have one player with an NIL deal. I'm like, that is such horse whatever so uh but anyway yeah if we're talking about coaches that we want to hang out with i think it starts with mike leach i think jimbo would be right after that you know somebody told me saban i'm like have you ever talked to the guy he's a miserable human being like i have no <laughs> interest in talking with him you know there was some report that you know when when lee corso hangs it up that maybe nick saban could take his place on college game day and i'm like have you seen him talk he's boring as hell he's like he's monotone he talks down here and i just we're just trying to play you know we're trying to play a great football like that's not exciting at all like mike leach at least right. will talk to you about candy corn and you know his favorite netflix series and all that and but pirates yeah pirates <laughs> he wrote the whole book swing your sword the interesting <laughs> thing guys i thought though was last week at sec media day some of you saw this you know every coach comes out with it with a intro you know, an introduction introduction statement. I remember back in the day, Les Miles would get up there and talk about his his summer vacations, and you know, my son uh, went uh, you know through a battle axe, and you know all these weird things that he used to tell. But like the word count on their opening opening speeches, Clark Lee at Vanderbilt, his opening uh, introduction at, at SEC Media Days was two thousand three hundred and forty words. It was the most Whoa. of any SEC coach, and I think the reason was. He realizes he has, he's at Vanderbilt and he doesn't want to answer any questions, so let me just filibuster. <laughs> Mike Leach had the least amount of words in his intro. It was seven words. I believe the exact words were, thanks so much for that intro, or thanks for the introduction, a- introductions, any questions. Like, that's all he said. Like, Mike Leach literally just gets up there and goes, all right, you guys have any questions? Like, he has nothing to tell you about his program or whatever. It's just, hey, let's just open it up and make it a free-for-all. So, you appreciate that. You like it. I don't know how much longer Mike Leach will be in the SEC because – Again, it's just the SEC West is a juggernaut. I don't think he'll ever have that year where he breaks through and wins 10, 11, 12 games. But we'll enjoy him while he's in the SEC because he is always good for a ridiculous soundbite. And, uh, yeah, this, his uh, his rant on candy corn last Halloween was one for the ages. <laughs> Perfect. Send him home. Bring him back to the pack or <laughs> the Big 12 or wherever we're headed because as long as he's around, I'm I'm a happy man. Like it's You know what you're getting in terms of the offense. I agree. You're probably not going to be there long and probably not the greatest coach of all time, but absolutely pure entertainment. He absolutely. Is. Now, the, the last thing I got for you, Chris, obviously you were at the Manning Passing Academy, which I don't think is quite on the level of the zeitgeist that the college football fans should probably – 
you know, realize like there's some really good quarterbacks that go to that camp. Um, who impressed you at that camp? I mean, it, it doesn't have to be from the SEC. It can be from all over. I know Jaden Delora from Arizona was there. Um, who who opened your eyes at that camp? Yeah, um, I think is it the Utah kid Cameron Rising? Uh -huh. uh, he looked yep. really good. I know a lot of people are very high on him, and they think he's a, he's somebody who can who could have a monster year this year. Um, all the SEC kids are really great. The the coolest thing about the the Manning Passing Academy. And by, it's put on by the Manning family, and they're all jerks, by the way, just terrible people to deal with. Um, oh, man. I joke. I mean, they're like the nicest people in the world. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. You, you had me concerned there, man. <laughs> no, I mean, like, really, I, I, literally, <laughs> I literally got to talk with Peyton Manning and Eli Manning. Like, they made an announcement because it came the day after Arch Manning made his, you know, announcement that he was committing to Texas. And they were like, uh -huh. please don't ask any of them about Arch. And then somebody asked Peyton, and he goes, oh, yeah. Well, and he goes on and on about the, the announcement and all this. And I was like, well, he could have been a jerk and been like, oh, I'm not here to talk about that. But it really is a cool deal. It's, it's put on down in Thibodeau, Louisiana, literally on the bayou. Like you drive to New Orleans or you fly into New Orleans and then you literally drive southwest for like an hour. And you and you come across Thibodeau, Louisiana. Nickel State is the school. And, yeah, there's like a bayou running through campus and kids are walking around in uh, shrimp and boots and, you know, took their boat to school. But um, oh my God. it's a really cool thing because it's a very relaxed atmosphere. The first and foremost, the cool thing is just to see them all get to coach these kids up. I mean, it's like a thousand kids out on the out on the practice field and they rotate them like every 10 to 15 minutes into drills. And so they get coached up by all these different guys that are, you know, quarterbacks across college football. And the. Uh, the interesting part is, you know, maybe one minute you're getting coached up by Clayton Toon, who's the the quarterback at, at the University of Houston that maybe no kid's ever heard of. And 10 minutes later, you're getting coached up by Bryce Young, the, re the reigning Heisman Trophy winner. I mean, it really is like it's a level playing field. Like all these kids are the same. But it's an interesting angle in that, like, they're not getting paid. They're there on their own accord. And there's nobody telling them what to do. So there was like one instance where Miles Brennan, the LSU quarterback, he gets his group and he goes, all right, are you guys my next group? All right, well, like, yes, let's do this. And then Anthony Richardson from Florida, he's like, all right, uh, I'm just going to do this drill because this is what I do. So it was kind of funny just to see that that standpoint of, like, these are college quarterbacks being asked to be coaches and being asked to, to run these kids through drills and stuff. So very cool, laid-back atmosphere. If you ever get a chance, you know, if you got a kid or a cousin or a nephew that that's interested in playing quarterback or wide receiver, it is worth – the experience to send them down there to get coached up by some of the biggest names in all of college football. But yeah, I mean, I, I would say there, there's a couple of guys that, you know, obviously all the SEC guys, they were very impressive. Like I said, Will Levis and, and Hendon Hooker, Bryce Young was just like a rock star walking around down there. But a couple of the kids to keep an eye on, uh, like I said, I think the the Cameron Rising kid, I think is is one that a lot of people are, are talking about because, you know, maybe Utah's got a chance to, to surprise. Uh, I forget mm -hmm. the Texas Tech, uh, kid's name but uh he was really impressive too he threw he threw a nice sharp ball and i believe he was a transfer uh as well um where he came from uh show tyler show maybe that, that's his name but uh yeah that's yes. what i got so yeah that's the name that, that rings for me so I, I think you're right on that but yeah it's a cool mix of just quarterbacks from all over the country coming together and by the way it was like 100 degrees that day watching these kids practice Ugh. and run around out there but in the bayou too oh yeah man. <laughs> but the coolest part about it is like I, we were able to get one-on-ones with everybody from spencer rattler to you know to levis and all these guys because it's a rare experience where they have no sid with them there's no you know, uh, media relations person from that school. It's literally them volunteering their own time. So you can just ask them anything you want. There's not going to be some, you know, uh, media person running over going, you can't ask them that, turn the camera off or whatever. So that's a really cool thing. And so, again, just, you know, if you ever get an opportunity to send your kid or go or attend the Manning Passing Academy, definitely worth it. And Archie's still out there in his golf cart getting around. And, man, no, no, <laughs> no, better, no better people than the Manning family to give you some expertise or tips on your game. Yeah, and, those, and I got to say, Chris, those, those interviews um, that you have on Lockdown, those little snippets from those quarterbacks, uh, whether it's coaches, quarterbacks, whoever you're getting access to, I mean, it does give you some some really great insight into what's going on. Like I know you mentioned the Spencer Rattler one earlier where he's really talking about no one being there in spring and how they're going to have to really clean it up this fall and just kind of gives you an idea where they're at. So if you're looking for like insider information, Lockdown SEC has it. Um, I just kind of wanted to ask you too, it, just because it's so cool to, to interview someone like the Mannings and I was with you there that you're joking. I think we all know the Mannings are good people. Dugan 
shame on you. Uh, but <laughs> ultimately, like, do you do you? You, you have great access and we're really excited to speak to Chris Gordy uh, today, but like who's really exciting that you've really been able to meet um, and talk to maybe, maybe it is the Mannings. Maybe that's the coolest person you've gotten a chance to kind of rub elbows with, or, or is there someone else that you've run out into out there or, or gotten the chance to maybe just like the most exciting person you've got to, to interview? Well, I mean, just from a, from an SEC perspective, um, one of my favorite guys to interview every year, year at SEC Media Days, and I think we're going to release it this week, is uh, Brad Nessler, who you know is the, does he's the voice on CBS doing uh you know the, the SEC game of the week uh, uh, across SEC football, but he's also called tons of college football, college basketball. I mean, he's called all these different things throughout his career, but to me what Brad Nessler will always be known as is the voice of NCAA football on EA sports. Like he is the guy who literally Speaking our language. Yeah. I mean, who literally is, is on the video game and he's immortalized. And I was disappointed when I asked him uh, in this interview, that's going to come out next week that, you know, he's, he's not been approached by EA sports about, you know, revisiting and being the guy. Cause you know, they're working on the new video game. And so it's not yep. going to be him. I don't know who's going to be the play by play voice, but for years, you know, and sitting in our college dorm room, we're playing the NCAA video game and, Brad Nessler was the voice. And so to be able to talk with him, and he's a guy who's called tons of stuff from bowl games to championships and everything. In the offseason, he's laid back Brad. He's got his Hawaiian shirt on. He's going down to his beach house in Florida or whatever, and he's just a really, really cool guy. So, like, yeah, I mean, the coaches and the players are all cool, but to me, talking to a guy like Brad Nessler, just a pro's pro of a professional uh, broadcaster, and if you like some of the best pipes, I think, in all of uh, college broadcasting as well. Brad Nessler so he's fun to talk to uh one of the one of the ones that we're going to have too on the podcast in a couple weeks that was just kind of unexpected we got to interview David Cutcliffe who just retired from coaching just hung it up at Duke and I didn't even realize he was he'd been at Duke for like a decade like and that's he and you know, I think of him like as an, a legendary SEC coach at Ole Miss and Tennessee and all this but he was an ACC coach and a ACC coach of the year a couple mm -hmm. times at Duke so uh, that was a really cool conversation too. talking about David Cutcliffe going back down memory lane, talking about coaching the Mannings and all that kind of stuff throughout his years. And, and that was that was really cool. And, and, and no disrespect to David Cutcliffe either. He looks really old. And I could not believe when I looked at his bio and saw he is three years younger than Nick Saban. Like kudos oh to whoever the hair dye, the, the guy who's dying Nick Saban's <laughs> hair. I mean, they just do a phenomenal job ironing out those wrinkles and making sure his hair doesn't turn gray because uh, it is unbelievable how that guy's still getting around in his early seventies. Yeah, I could hear you. I could hear you like itching to push him out, but the guy <laughs> seems like a vampire, and, and, and he may be around haunting you for a long, long time. But I mean, as an SEC fan, I'd be like, this Nick Saban guy's got to be done. Like, doesn't he get tired? Like, he, he must need well, sleep or so something. Real quick <laughs> on that on that thought, guys. Like, if Nick Saban, let's just say Nick Saban had never come back to college football. Let's say he he stays with the Miami Dolphins in 07 uh and ends up having a long NFL career and then just retires and he's sitting at his lake house now if Nick Saban never comes back to the SEC you're literally talking about Les Miles wins another championship at LSU in 2011 uh I think Kirby Smart maybe uh I think Kirby Smart at least has another championship at Georgia you know at least at least two maybe even three uh, you think back to Gus Malzahn probably is a two-time national championship winner at Auburn. Like you just think of all the dominoes that could have fallen had Nick Saban not come back to college football. You would have had way more parity, I think, across right. not just the SEC but all the college football. I mean, Ohio State's probably got another championship or two. Maybe Oklahoma, Bob Stoops, they break through and win another one. So it's just uh, it, it's just interesting what could have happened, but. It just shows how dominant Saban has been through this run. It's ridiculous. Yeah, Saban definitely has been kind of the grim reaper of the SEC for, for some of these coaches. I, I guarantee a lot of them have been fired simply for not being able to beat Saban. So, oh, Steve Sarkeesian insane. is like counting down the day. He's like, how many days? 2025 when we get to the SEC? Please, God, be gone by then. I can I can maybe win the SEC and win a championship if Saban's out. <laughs> and that and that's a great segue because we did want to just touch on this and I, I know we're you know we'll, we'll try to get you out of here but um the oklahoma texas situation obviously it seems like a moving date but 2025 seems like maybe that's it um i don't know uh, Braden didn't seem too concerned he kind of brushed it off like hey these guys you know they, they don't really have it all figured out they're not just going to roll in here to the sec but it sounds like in maybe some of your discussions you're like hey man those those schools have a lot of money and if they do get it figured out they have a couple of years to do that um you know, they could be a threat. So I guess 
you know, where do you sit on that? Maybe I'm misreading some of it, but I'd love to hear just kind of your thoughts on, on Texas, Oklahoma joining and, and what you think that that might look like. Yeah, I keep thinking 2024 is when it's going to happen. I know I, I had Greg Sankey on the show last week, the commissioner of the SEC, and asked him, you know, what's, you know, is, can this happen earlier? And he keeps saying that has nothing to do with us. That's between Texas and Oklahoma and the Big 12. You know, they they have mm-hmm. rights agreements, and it's about, you know, paying the money to get the buyout and, and getting out of your agreement early. But here's the problem with the Big 12. You've already announced next July your four new schools are all are all joining in uh, Houston, UCF, uh, Cincinnati, and BYU. It's going to be really awkward to bring those guys in and have Oklahoma and Texas with one foot in the door, one foot out the door for two more years. Now, I understand they're going to bring a lot of revenue. I have some friends who go to the University of Houston and uh, friends who go cover UCF who've said, man, like you imagine if we get two years of either Oklahoma or Texas coming here for a home game, like that would be huge. But it just feels like one of those things. I think somebody made the comparison. It's like you and your wife have already agreed to divorce as soon as your uh, daughter graduates high school and you're into her senior year. It's like, why are you delaying the inevitable? Like we know this, this is already a divorce. You guys have already separated. Like, let's just move on. Let's, let's let bygones be right. bygones. Let's turn the page and let's go. Um, again, Greg Sankey says that's between the big 12 and, and, and those two schools. But I would just think if you're the commissioner of the big 12, man, don't you want to move on? Don't you want to turn the page? Like, Tell, you know, come up with a dollar figure, tell Texas and Oklahoma, pay us this dollar figure and let's and let's move on. Let's try to start building. I mean, they've already said we're open for conversations for more expansion for the Big 12. So if you're if you're going that route, then get the two lame duck schools that are just hanging around your conference out conference out sooner. So that's why I think 2024 is what's going to make sense. We're going to go through this season. And I think by next summer, there will be an announcement that all right, 2023 will be the final year of Texas and Oklahoma in the Big 12, and they'll move to the SEC starting in 2024. At least that's just my guess. Yeah, and I mean, hey, you have Arizona and Utah waiting in the in the wings to replace Texas and Oklahoma. So I think it's a pretty fair trade, right? Yeah, uh, about that. <laughs> um, I mean, there's not going to be any, any good answer, but I, I will say, like, I like what the Big 12 has done. Like, Houston is a big brand that when Mm -hmm. Tom Herman was there, I mean, he showed that they could get the double digit wins in football. Their basketball program has been phenomenal with Kelvin Sampson that getting a final four elite eights and all this. So I think they make a lot of sense. UCF, obviously track record of what they've done the past five, six, seven years in football. They've been fantastic. BYU always, uh, you know, just one of those contending teams feels like they win eight, eight, nine games a year in football. Basketball's always making the tournament. Uh, and then Cincinnati, they've been the big, you know, the the prom queen as of late, getting to the playoff last year in football. And man, Luke Fickle staying put there seems like they could they could build a winner there. So I do yeah. think like you lose Texas and Oklahoma, there's nobody you're going to get to replace them that's going to be good, uh, good mm-hmm. enough. But I think those four programs are pretty good, all things considered. And again, like you guys said, we'll see who is next. If the Pac-12 is going to completely fall apart here. Yeah, I think there's a lot of good teams that would make that would, you know, have a lot of interest, whether it be the Arizona schools or you know, I, I still think Oregon's the weird one because they just I think geography has to make some sense in uh in all this expansion stuff. I like kept hearing Oregon of the ACC. Like, why? You know, how ridiculous. Yeah. That's going to be like, you know, when you go play cross country, that equipment truck's got to leave on a Monday morning and not get mm-hmm. there till like Friday evening. So, like, uh, yeah, I just think geography has to make a little bit of sense when we talk all this uh, conference expansion stuff. Yeah. And then in terms of competition, like, do you think that Oklahoma and Texas can jump in there right away and make some noise? Or do you think it's going to take a couple of years? No, I mean, it's the SEC is the wild, wild, you know, the the wild, wild west. Like somebody has to suck. I try to tell people this all the time. I have a friend who was like, man, I hate these non-conference games. We're going to play uh, the Citadel or North, uh-huh. you know, Louisiana Monroe and all this. I'm going, dude, those are your red wins. Those are your teams, your, your games to like tune up for. If you want to add like Clemson and Notre Dame to the SEC, who's going to lose? Like somebody has to suck and it's probably going to be your school. So, you know, that, that's where I say, like, if you're, if you're a fan of an SEC school and you want them to expand, you know who I'm calling? Virginia, uh, Indiana, uh, you know, Wake Forest. Like, give me some schools that I think we could probably beat in football. Not adding Clemson and Notre Dame. Like, give me a break. Mm-hmm. It's just going to make it that much tougher on everybody. So. I always say, be careful what you wish for. We all look at this and, you know, we want the sexiest schools. We want the the baddest ass schools. But like, OK, you bring those schools in, your team's going to suck because you can't beat them all. It's just not possible. 
Yeah, totally. So, I mean, Texas and Oklahoma could definitely come in and make some noise then. I mean, we're already seeing it with Texas. You mentioned Arch Manning coming in. They have Quinn Ewers. So, I mean, hey, those guys are probably going to be around for SEC football. At least Arch Manning will be. So, could definitely be some interesting times in the SEC for sure. No doubt. And let me just say something, too. When did Lincoln Riley become God's gift to football? Why is everyone jumping on he's going to win a national championship at USC in year one? Like, I've seen people making these bets and all. I'm like, he couldn't even win one at Oklahoma. Like, he got to the playoff every year and then got embarrassed by SEC schools. I don't understand this thought. Oh, he's got Caleb Williams with him. Great. Caleb Williams won how many games last year? A couple? Like, I I don't understand the thought that Lincoln Riley's going to – I mean, look – I guess they need somebody to turn USC around and at least let them compete for the Pac-12, and he'll probably do that. Uh, So in that that aspect, it's a win because USC's been down since Pete Carroll left, basically. But, uh, man, like, get off the Lincoln Riley's going to bring us back to prominence and win championships at USC. I just don't think that's happening. Yeah, it's, it's got to be just the Heismans, though, right? I mean, he just, like, they were giving away all the, like, every Heisman trophy went to Oklahoma. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's just, I mean, and I, I'm kind of with you, like, cause I don't, I never really got it that we just had to reward that system over and over again. And we kind of know what it is. And then these quarterbacks get drafted really high in the NFL. They've been whatever and still yet to be determined a bit. But, I mean, I think that's what it is. It's just the Heisman, you know, you're attaching it to the Heisman. And if you can create that kind of quarterback that, is at least prolific enough to win that award, then presumably you're going to continue to get quarterbacks and USC has been traditionally rich in quarterbacks. So I get where like they're doing it, but I also very much see your point in like, this seems a little overrated. Yeah. Look, if you want to win a crappy big 12 conference and you want to put up a ton of numbers and you want your quarterback to win the Heisman and you want to make it to the playoff. And then in that playoff game, lose to an SEC school, 63 to 28, then Lincoln Riley is your guy. Then absolutely <laughs> sign to sign up right now. Here's the dotted line. But like, yeah, I just okay. He's going to go to the Pac-12. Who's down right now? Great. You can win the Pac-12 at, at USC. Fantastic. But what are you going to do when you meet a big boy in the in the playoff like you have every year? It, it's they get embarrassed. And so again, we'll see what happens. I, I don't know what the the Pac-12 is going to do. Whether they're going to sustain. Whether they're going to add schools, rebuild, whatever. But uh, yeah, just forgive me if I'm not jumping on the Lincoln Riley hype train just yet. Yeah, I get it. And and I would say with that, Chris, I mean, I, honestly, we we thank you so much for your time. We don't need to keep you much longer. I do want it to open up to you if you just wanted to. If there's anything else you want to get off your chest in terms of college football, anything you want to share with Locked On SEC, uh, basically the floor is yours for for anything and everything that you want to share. And, and outside of that, we just want to thank you for being like an incredible guest, uh, like so gracious with your time. And uh, you're obviously welcome back here anytime, my man. Yeah, sure, guys. I'll just say this. I think uh, the, the only thing we didn't get to was just guys that I think can can have a meteoric rise this year for looking at, uh, you know, uh, mock drafts and things like that. There's a couple names in the SEC that I just think are two guys that are going to climb up draft boards. One is a defensive end at LSU by the name of B.J. Ojolari. He's the younger brother of Aziz Ojolari, who was a high pick of Ooh, the New York Giants. That's right. he, he had seven sacks last season for LSU. He's going into his junior season. I call it his money year. I think he's going to have a fantastic year and wind up being a first-round pick next year. And then another guy, linebacker, Georgia, Nolan Smith. Uh, he was at media days. Dude is just a tackling machine. He was fifth in tackles last year. Their one, two, three, four leading tacklers are all gone in the NFL now. So he's the leader. He had a couple sacks, interceptions, and forced fumbles last year. And I think Nolan Smith's going to be that next guy to climb up draft boards. So just give you a couple of names to watch when you're watching uh, you know, on Saturdays and flipping through the channels and you can come across some of these uh, – SEC schools, just a couple guys that may be coming to an NFL team near you very soon. I love it, man. I love the BJ Ojolari stuff because I was really big on his brother when his brother was at Georgia. And his brother did, you know, some some pretty good things his rookie year for the Giants. So, man, that's definitely a name I will have circled on on my guide every time I watch because um, I'm a big NFL draft nerd. So that that's exciting for sure. Well, Chris, like, like John said, man, you've been incredible. We absolutely appreciate every second of time you've given us today. We will definitely probably be asking you to come back on maybe, you know, before bowl season or NFL draft, what have you. And uh, again, guys, if you're not following Chris, please follow him on Twitter. Listen to Locked On SEC for all your SEC um, needs. Chris, again, you've been a wonderful guest and we appreciate every second of time you've given us today. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Anytime. Awesome. All right, guys, we will let you go. Have a great rest of your week. And remember, uh, we will have a new episode next week about the Big Ten. So be on the lookout for that. Thanks, guys. Bye. 